Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and tonight a video that I probably should have already made about two weeks ago. But you know, I've been so busy tying up loose ends on some current series. This one kind of got left off to the wayside a bit too long in my opinion. Now, as you know, around that time, I had announced my third choice for Mount Rock Olympus, my third favorite rock band of all time, Pink Floyd. So tonight what I want to do is I'm going to review and give my comments on their magnificent masterpiece, The Dark Side of the Moon. But first of all, just a quick thank you. We've reached 75,000 views, of course. And as of tonight, the channel has reached 900 subscribers. That's you folks. I just want to say thank you. And you know what? Tonight, I'd like to really truly encourage you to watch the end of this particular video. I'm going to spend that time on a shout out, but not just a regular shout out. This is a shout out of gratitude as well as a recommendation I had already been working on for the last week or two. And of course, as I reach my conclusions toward the end of the video, I always give shout outs to new subscribers. You know, the influx of subscribers over the last 24 hours have been such a big increase, and I'll discuss that in my final comments at the end of this video, that, you know what, it may take me a couple of videos to get you all on board. So at the end of this video tonight, the first of this new batch of subscribers to join will be included in this video. All right, so that's about as much channel business as I dare cover at the beginning of a video. Let's get into the meat of tonight's subject. You know, this album, The Dark Side of the Moon, is the very best album, in my opinion, that Pink Floyd ever recorded. Now, The Dark Side of the Moon was recorded between May of 1972 and January of 1973, shortly after on March 1st of 1973, it was released. You know, when I come to think of it, one of my very favorite Led Zeppelin albums may have suffered as far as sales and acceptance because of the release of this album. This album by this band is an artistic masterpiece, and I believe an artistic masterpiece in every sense of the word, and we're gonna discuss why I feel the way I do. Their original leader and main concept director, Sid Barrett, losing interest in the band, that's when they hired David Gilmour, really to do nothing more than to play guitar whenever Sid decided not to perform at a scheduled concert. His presence diminished further and further along those lines, David Gilmore taking a, a more active role and eventually you had the four members that we see on the dark side of the moon. But you know, it wasn't just losing a member at this point. That member wasn't lost to him being thrown out of the band or anything. That member was lost due to mental illness. And you know, it's by no means a small wonder that many of Pink Floyd's songs explore the darkest corners of mental illness, for sure. First, when I heard it, just a damn good rock album, right? Ooh, man, and it, such a gloss to it. And man, you could just tell it was recorded at Abbey Road Studios. And I'm talking about dynamics, I'm not talking about style. It had a lot of sonic similarities to the magnificent Abbey Road by the Beatles. And we've already discussed how this album was started. First of all, the loss of Sid Barrett. And I do want to bring out another thing here. With the exception of a couple, maybe three tracks here, these aren't necessarily Pink Floyd's very best songs ever, but there are at least three songs on this album that are amongst their very best. I'll concede that. But you know, it's because it has fewer songs and longer pieces in between that draws attention to those songs. You almost have to take some of these tracks together. Now I'm going to try and do a breakdown on each track, but I may mention from time to time similarities between this track and that one and how one track placed properly in the mix and edited properly on this album could take a pretty damn good song and make it into a great song. 
we'll discuss some of those aspects as well. But you know, in between the time period, Sid Barrett left the band and they started recording this in May of 1972, the band started questioning themselves a bit. They were gradually bringing down their very long pieces into shorter pieces, and they had even developed a suite of this, evidently recorded prior to the proper recordings in May. So all of these things were happening with the band, right? There's a definite band decision to shorten their pieces a bit at this point. And at this point, the band members are interested in the very latest tech, right down to their drummer. The first track being his particular pet project. It introduces the entire album. So Pink Floyd at this point was experimenting with new sounds, modifying their whole approach, shortening their approach, not always, they would still have longer tracks, but there would have to be a good reason why that track was longer, always from this point on. So if you think the band almost seemed fated to produce a fantastic album, you're probably right. But you know what? It didn't stop there. They had access to Abbey Road Studios, 16 track Abbey Road Studio, along with the same ultra clean transistor driven boards that gave the Beatles their last magnificent album sound, Abbey Road. That's that gloss, all recorded without tubes. Now just think of what that offers. They're interested in sounding different. Here is the one studio in England that sounds different. But it doesn't stop there, guys. You see, the band was interested at this point in a portable little expensive device. It was called the EMS VCS3, the first truly portable synthesizer. Now, the only weakness for this type of synthesizer is it staying in tune because it's based on an oscillating current and it didn't keep tune real well, but with some finagling when it was necessary, they were able to tame the beast. And on top of that, they were looking for sounds that didn't necessarily have to be right in tune. They were trying to create colors with this new wonderful instrument at their disposal. You know, you've heard me say one of my favorite DVDs was a film I went to go see shortly after Let It Be was released. I was about 16 or 17 years old when Pink Floyd's movie Live at Pompeii came out. I don't think that was the original title, but that's what they're calling it these days. You know I went and saw that movie dozens of times. But anyway, what was wonderful in that movie is there's footage of them dealing with these synthesizers there and actively trying to create the sounds of what would become the sound of the dark side of the moon. Now it's by this time, the band has been around a while. They've got their groupies and they're living their lives a bit on the edge here at this point, right? As a matter of fact, as evidence and with some of Waters' lyrics, certainly, they're even starting to question this early, whether this is really a, a, a healthy lifestyle to begin with. And of course, as a group, they're going to explore the darkness of at least dysfunctionality, if not outright, mental illness. It's all there, and it's right there in the title of the album, folks, with Dark Side of the Moon being analogous to losing your mind, right? And, and those elements are all on this album, don't get me wrong, but there's also concern with the amount of time we have on this planet. How do we balance ourselves in this modern world? Those things we want and desire versus the things we perhaps shouldn't try to investigate, right? Now the writers on this album, this to me is Pink Floyd perfectly mixed as far as who writes how many songs per album. If they could have stayed with this structure, I can't even contemplate just how great their albums would have been from this point on. Here we see Waters responsible for writing five of these tunes. Nick Mason is responsible for writing three of these tunes. And David Gilmore and Richard Wright are both responsible for being co-writers or writers of four tunes each. There is almost for the first time and perhaps the last time in Pink Floyd's career a democratic approach to recording an album and I think it's one of the strengths 
on this album, as well as a couple of more circumstances that just went their way. And only one of those circumstances was they kind of inherited Alan freaking Parsons as their engineer. So exactly what did they inherit with Alan Parsons? Well, he was the assistant engineer on some of the recordings for Let It Be and almost all the recordings on Abbey Road. You know, in my opinion, Alan Parsons is not only one of the best engineers in rock, he'd be in or very near to my top 10, maybe comfortably in there actually, the more I think about it. But you know, the Alan Parsons Project, as an artistic band making valid artistic statements, I'm a big fan of. You know, I got to see him in a real small theater and I got to shake the man's hand and personally thank him for so much enjoyment that I've received through all of his musical efforts. And you know, it, that's got to be the millionth time the guys heard that. And yet he was still gracious and didn't make me feel like I was intruding into his life. And one of my most cherished concert memories. They were hot that night, by the way. So here we have a new approach to writing songs, a more democratic effort in writing songs, a willingness to explore with their brand new portable synthesizer, an engineer who was also very familiar with that synthesizer, by the way, he would continue to use it with the Alan Parson project. And at that time, when you were working with these analog synthesizers, a transistor board, especially the quality of the one they had at Abbey Road, just offered such a clean sound. And that's one of this album's secrets to success. This glossy sound, no matter how dark this album gets, you feel like you're experiencing something far grander, like a vision versus a mere dream that you can barely remember. And with Roger Waters messing with tapes at his home, getting the original ideas as far as the material that he was going to offer and getting the band to back him up on where he wanted to go with this and the entire band pretty much writing as evenly as they would ever write, we get an album that transcends their approach from metal. A wonderful album, by the way, in many ways, and we'll cover that album in the future. But this was definitely Pink Floyd almost stepping into the light by investigating the darkness. And brother, was this album a hit. You know, it charted for 962 weeks on Billboard's top albums. You know, that's about 18 and a half years, folks. I'd say that's pretty damn good chart duration, if you ask me. And you know, it was around this time with people buying combo stereos that offered FM radio right along with AM radio. The release of this album, released when it did, it hit the deck running. And of course, in 2012, it was chosen to be preserved by the National Recording Registry. All right, so as a final thought for this video, and keep this in mind as we get into part two in my next video, I want you to remember, Rolling Stone Magazine has named this the 35th best album of all time. No, I'm serious. They had the audacity to rank this album as low as number 35. Are you kidding me? And one final thought, the cover design, brilliant. Another brilliant cover provided by the company, Hypnosis. All right, so that about covers tonight's video. Part two is in the works. I'll get it out to you as soon as possible, folks. For all you viewers who have been visiting this channel for the last 24 hours, you've probably noticed a significant amount of subscriber growth. And you know, with that in mind, it's at that time of the video that I usually have some shout outs here. You know, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get to all of you tonight, but I will get to you eventually. And what I'm gonna do is include the first names who signed up first. And so if your name isn't there tonight, it'll be in the next video. I'm keeping track. And a big thank you for all of you who have joined the tribe. You know, they found it so easy, guys. If you haven't done that yet, all they did was hit that subscribe to the tribe button and of course hit the top bell notification. 
And guess what? Every single one of them have been notified of all of my videos. And if you've been with the channel for any amount of time, you know that I've given shout outs to other channels, other channels that I've recommended that you might enjoy watching. And you know, that's kind of where this whole story unfolds. All right, so let's go back 24 hours. I'm busy reading all the comments that you guys have given me and doing my best to respond to each and every one of them. Finally, after about 45 minutes, I came across one of our subscribers whose comments I have a lot of respect for. Hi, Helene. And she was letting me know that I was getting this terrific shout out from a fellow channel. Now, of course, at that point, I put Helene on hold and I went over to the channel to see what was up. Now, you've got to understand, I was already a subscriber to this other channel. It was Helene who had told me a week or two, maybe three weeks ago, she would highly recommend that I take a look at Soul Train Bro. So I did. I watched about five or six of his videos just to get a flavor of it, and I immediately subscribed. So I've been a subscriber. So you can imagine my surprise when my wife and I both went over the channel and we watched the video. Right away, he had a still picture of me and he was talking about my channel. Well, you can only imagine how dumbfounded I was when Wayne actually shared my entire video and made some nice comments about it as well. You know, he didn't have to do that. All I can say, Wayne, is thank you. You have something to say no matter what subject you're talking about. And I want you to know it was a real honor to be represented on your channel. Thank you so much. All right, guys, so that's part one of The Dark Side of the Moon. And it's in part two that I will discuss the album proper. And it's my intention to have that out in the next few days, as well as wrapping up on my series with Led Zeppelin and the magnificent album, Presence, as well as their final album, In Through the Outdoor. A great big thank you to all of our viewers. I'm Michael Nolan. This is The Bottom Line and I'll see you in my next video.